To the Bridgegate trial now, and after six weeks of hearing varying accounts about what actually happened at the George W. Bridge, both before and during that September week in 2013, and now two days of closing arguments, the jury is deciding if co-defendants Bill Baroni and Bridget Kelly are guilty or not of conspiracy. Faustman's Kimberly Wallace, she's outside the federal courthouse in Newark with more. After three years of wondering who was responsible for the Bridgegate laid closures and whether or not anyone from Governor Christie's office would be held accountable, we will soon have an answer. The fates of co-defendants Bill Baroni and Bridget Kelly are now in the hands of a 12-person jury. Earlier today, in closing arguments, Kelly's attorney Michael Critchley highlighted a glaring omission many have been asking about this trial. Where is Chris Christie? Critchley asked the question while pointing to the witness stand. Critchley calling Christie a coward several times throughout his closing. He went on to say the governor of New York is also responsible for the late closures and cover-up. Quote, Cuomo and Christie were involved from the beginning and they were directing their operatives from the top down. I gave my summation. My summation was based upon what I thought were the reasonable inferences that someone could draw from the testimony and my words are what my words are. Why didn't you call Governor Christie to the stand? But I don't have, I nor any defendant has a burden of proof. Bridget Kelly got on that stand, testified, and if anyone wanted to challenge it, they could have challenged it. Critchley also saying the government's key witness, David Wildstein, quote, is the Bernie Madoff of New Jersey politics. I had an opportunity to present what I thought was our theory of defense. I gave my characterizations of what I felt Wildstein was and is. Kelly and co-defendant Bill Baroni have both maintained they thought the 2013 delayed closures in question were for a traffic study, not political payback. But in the government's rebuttal, they reminded the 12-person jury the evidence is overwhelming, showing emails prior to the September 2013 delayed closure saying Kelly embraced the punitive attitude of the governor's office. The government maintains that the defendants worked with former Port Authority executive David Wildstein, who has already pleaded guilty and testified against against Baroni and Kelly to create the traffic jams as retribution against the mayor of Fort Lee for not supporting Christie's re-election campaign. Kelly and Baroni faced nine counts, including misapplying Port Authority resources and conspiring to cover it up. And jury deliberation continues tomorrow. For RFL, I'm Kimberly Wallace. And while most are watching the trial to see what, if any, impact the verdict will have on Governor Christie, certainly it's all but crippled him politically. The fallout from Bridgegate, it is also beginning to spill over on the other side of the river, most namely near Governor Andrew Cuomo. Now, listen, you looked at the polls. He is literally, I'm talking about Christie right now, in the all-time levels in terms of disapproval. Um, for, and who knows where he goes from here. But nonetheless... What's your sense? I mean, you've heard a lot of what's been testified to or not. You've heard what Kelly has said, Baroni has said. It certainly paints a picture that this wasn't a decision some functionaries could have made here. The governor had to be involved, not just in a cultural sense, but he had to know what was going on. They're going to shut down the busiest bridge in America for four days, a few lanes on it, right? Right. Five people testified under oath at this Bridgegate trial. Five people that Christie knew uh, about these lane closures at the very least after they had happened and maybe before but certainly while they were going on Christie knew five people including his deputy chief of staff his chief political strategist and his press secretary they five but five people testified so you know I was at a concert last night and uh, with probably a lot of uh, undecided or Trump voters I won't tell you it was fun uh, and Christie's name came up and you would expect maybe there would be some residual good goodwill zero People were booing him mm. in this theater in, in New Jersey. So, yes, his career is over. Uh, probably, well, sir, let's put it this way. These are all, this is all his making. Yeah. And, you know, Andrew, it's a couple of sidebars on this. One, um, uh, and we'll talk about next segment, and it's the fourth anniversary since uh, Hurricane Sandy hit, and we talk about the relief in New Jersey residents uh, who originally gave praise to how it was handled now, still very bitter and pointing at the governor for how they still are not made whole after the storm. But also, we got a story over the weekend that he had actually all but successfully convinced Donald Trump to make Trump, to have Trump make him his running mate. Yeah. And then the insider said, no, 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 whatever you do, not him. And they obviously worked for Pence. But um, where this is interesting to me is, this now, what we've learned during the trial is there was constant correspondence between the two governors. We don't know yet what one said to the other, but there's some legitimate questions as to 
what did Cuomo know and when did he know it? And it certainly seems like New York's reaction to everything was somewhat muted and, and that Cuomo, at least from some indications, <clears throat> did not want to make more out of this than was happening. He certainly didn't throw the governor under the, the bus. Yeah. And we had been hearing, you know, Rob Astorino was his Republican uh, opponent in 2014, and we had been hearing from inside the Astorino campaign for some time that they thought there was a quid pro quo, that there was a basically a detente between Christie and Cuomo to serve their both mutual uh, interests. It, 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 it sounded like one of those tinfoil hat kind of moments, but we're starting to get some evidence that maybe that was, in fact, mm. what happened, and, and there was a non-aggression pact between the two governors. It's going to be an interesting next uh, year for the governor. After this election, I'm talking in New York, uh, where Cuomo goes from here, what is the makeup of the state senate, which could go either way, um, and then also, obviously, with the investigation of his good friend, Mr. Prococo, et cetera, it's going to be a very interesting 12 months, don't you think? I think so. And, and in terms of what Andrew said about Rob Astorino, I mean, there is no question that there was an agreement. Look at you have the head of the Republican Governors Association, Chris Christie, who refuses to go across the river and have lunch with the person running for governor of the neighboring state in Rob Astorino. Mm. There's no way that happens by, by accident. Guys, excellent conversation. Thank you all very much. Jeannie, Dominic, Steve, and Andrew. Up next, Superstorm Sandy four years later. As some residents continue to wait for their homes to be rebuilt, others regret ever even trying to rebuild, while some residents push back on one of our region's governors, I'll let you guess who, saying he still hasn't done enough. Stay with us.